Deep listening. 深度聆听 Deep listening. Intensive 触摸 Deep listening. Al istima al amiq. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. We might not think very much about what we listen, and so when you have that, I want to say eye opening because there's not a better cliche for it. But yeah, once your ears are opened and you realise what more is out there, then you suddenly sort of, I guess, appreciate things more. And are also more conscious of what you're missing out on. Deep listening. Écoute attentive. Bene ascoltare. Ukulalela fieleja. In this episode of Deep Listening: Impact Beyond Words, we have an amazing opportunity to see both sides of a listening environment. We speak to Cam, an acoustic engineer, and a lead violinist with the Brisbane Philharmonic Orchestra. Cam talks us through the perspective of what's involved when creating music, the maths behind a violin, and how sound interacts with your ear and ultimately with your brain. But when we get taken on a different tour, where Cam talks about the interaction between sound and space in auditoriums, concert halls, restaurants. And how listening environments are created when you think about the physical attributes of them. Listen now as he talks about how to make a really impactful office listening environment, so that you can hear your colleagues. Let's listen to Cam. Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. Fifty-five percent of our day is spent listening, and yet. Only two percent of us are taught how to listen. We're taught how to read and write. We're taught how to speak. We're helped out in how to walk.、Um, have you got any theories about why we're not trained on how to listen? It's an interesting one, and certainly, like in my professional role as an acoustic engineer, I would really love if people had much more awareness of sounds and the way that it does have such a big impact on what we do in our day-to-day lives. I guess. Maybe one of the main reasons is that we're, we have a tendency to be such visual creatures, and although we do use sound so much for communication, that we sort of take it for granted a little bit because it's always there. Whereas it's, I guess, in the analogy of someone reading and writing, it's pretty obvious if you can't read, but it's not so obvious if you don't know how to listen deeply because you can sort of get by. I find it really interesting to walk into a new place and sort of experience for the first time. You、might like to think of it as like tourism of sound.、And、it can be something as simple as just like when you're walking away from a busy road and, and you start hearing how sound just the environment slightly changes as you walk away, and then eventually you might hear like the first bird singing. The very slow way that our urban noise environment changes as you go from place to place. It takes a little bit of training to get there, I guess, of being becoming used to sort of thinking about well, what am I hearing? For the first question, but also where am I hearing it from? And then once once you get used to sort of training your ears in that way and and having a listen, then you'll notice things like you might walk into a room that has a bit of an echo in it, and then your voice starts sounding different. Or you'll walk into the opposite sort of a, a room that's really dead, and it feels like the the room is almost sort of sucking sucking the sound out of the air, and the way that things sound so much differently in each space. I guess sort of unlocking that extra. Extra dimension of the way that you listen sort of really just means that when you be filled with wonder of hearing things new for the first time. What was life like growing up for you? Where were you born, and what was the dinner table conversation like? I'm the youngest of three kids, with there's ten years between me and the next one up. So the、so、dinner table conversation was a lot of all the a lot of people a lot older than me、uh, sitting around and talking, and sort of me occasionally getting to contribute. So, and I think that probably kept on going as well.、Um, about ten years later, once my brother and sister had moved out of the house, and again dealing with sort of adults a lot. So, I think I was in the situation of having to do that proverbial sort of seen and not heard, and listen a lot more than I spoke. Whether it was because of that or something else, it's、um, kind of, I guess, led to me having a bit of an interest in sounds. Coupled to that was that I started playing the violin when I was about five or six, and. I still can't remember exactly why I wanted to play the violin, but none of my relatives or anything like that had really played it. But something obviously attracted my interest about it, 
and over the years of first a little bit of practice and then some more practice and then some more practice got to the point where I actually started to like the sound that I was creating. And so I, I continued to play it when it came time to sort of pick what I wanted to do. And again, I have no idea where this came from, but if you have a look at my year 12, uh, um, yearbook, as well as a very questionable photo, there's the, what do you want to do? And I put down acoustic engineering. I still have no idea where that actually came from, but it seems like a very logical thing for someone who has a musical background and also developed through school an interest in science. That's a way of uh, combining technology and the artistic side of things in the music. So I then did my degree and started doing some work experience actually at Arup, the company where I currently work, when I was 19 and then started with them full time when I was 21. And uh, the rest, as I say, is history. I've now been working for them for just over 10 years full time. For those of us who have never been in an orchestra, talk to me about the role of the first violin. So in the orchestra that I'm playing with now, which is Brisbane Philharmonic, I'm the concertmaster, which is a fancy word for the lead violin. And it's basically the person who's responsible under the conductor of sort of coordinating what the orchestra is doing. And the most visible part of that is probably that the person that tunes the orchestra at the beginning of the concert and the beginning of any rehearsal. It's not like a dictatorship or anything like that, but everyone in the orchestra has their part to play. But to avoid it from devolving into chaos, the concertmaster should be the person that sort of takes other people's contributions and sort of helps to sort of bring them all together into a musical whole that then sort of works with the conductor. So in one way, it's sort of it's acting as a sort of intermediary between the conductor and the orchestra. And that's especially the case if there isn't a permanent conductor and you're dealing with a guest conductor each time, which actually happens to be the case with my orchestra that we work with a different conductor for every one of our programs. When that magical moment happens immediately before the performance commences and in your role you're helping the orchestra tune its instruments. What are you actually listening for at that point? Well, at the simplest, it's listening to make sure everyone's actually picking up the right right notes and they're all tuning to the same A and that everyone's definition of what's in tune is the same. But with a really good group of musicians, you start to hear the uh, sort of the next level of information. And especially, I'm going to use a string instrument as an example, just because that's what I play. But you start off by tuning your A string and then to tune the other three strings, you have to do some really fine listening where if the strings are completely or are perfectly in tune, you actually get what's called beats or tartini tones. And that's basically where the, the two notes are in such close um, mathematical relationships. So on a, a violin, which is tuned in fifths, the frequency of one string compared to the frequency of another string should be in the ratio of three to two. And because there's that mathematical sort of, well, quite literally like resonance between the two strings, when they're perfectly in tune, you actually hear what's called beats. And that's where the you can hear like a little wong, wong, wong. That's the sort of best uh, thing that I can approximate it with the voice. You hear these little interference tones where the, the sound of the note does vary and it varies a certain number of times per second. And that's related to how in tune or out of tune the notes are. When you first listen to a note, you might think, oh, yeah, that's in tune. But then when you listen a little bit more carefully and you realize that it might be very fractionally out. And then when you go and hear it for the second time and you hear the harmony of something that is now perfectly in tune, it sounds so natural and so obvious that you kind of wonder, well, how did I ever think that that was in tune now that I've heard what can be in tune? We might not think very much about what we listen. And so when you have that, I want to say eye-opening, because there's not a better cliche for it, but... Yeah, once your ears are opened and you realise what more is out there, then you suddenly sort of, I guess, appreciate things more and are also more conscious of what you're missing out on. Deep listening. L'écoute profonde. Akshava amuka. Deep listening. What do great conductors do to listen to the entire orchestra and the individuals in that orchestra that maybe distinguishes them from OK conductors? Well, I think one of the things that really does set a really good conductor apart is their ability just to be able to hear what's happening between potentially up to like 90 to 100 musicians simultaneously and be able to hear if there's something wrong straight up and be able to say, straight, so like, oh, second bassoon, you're slightly flat. Or whoever has the e, e flat in that chord, can you make it a little bit sharper? And just be able to pick out this one element of a very complex sound 
and identify what's right or what's wrong there so quickly. Whereas most people would have to sort of, all right, everyone stop, everyone start playing one at a time and then you'll notice the point where it sort of starts going wrong. That's a very looking at what's wrong kind of thing approach to a good conductor. And there's definitely a role for that of the conductor is there to try and fix, work out what the problem is and then fix it and improve it. But I think where a great conductor comes into it as well is that they're, they're a positive thing rather than a correcting a negative. They're inspiring looks to do better things. They're, they have a vision for the sort of sound they want to create and they're able to communicate that in a way that helps the orchestra to understand how to produce that sound. I was once told that the difference between a good conductor and a great conductor is a good conductor is focused on the orchestra and a great conductor is focused on the interplay between the orchestra and the audience. How true is that? I think I'd agree. Musical performance should have an element of theatricality to it. And it definitely should be more interesting than just listening to a CD at home. Even if the playing is objectively not as good as what you're getting on a CD, there's that the realness of being in a real room listening to real musicians, I think, has something that a CD potentially never will be able to replicate. How do you think the conductor listens to the audience while they're in performance? You can sort of, I think, hear when the audience is listening intently. There's a, there's a different quality of silence. The cliche is to sort of use silence as the absence of noise, and I guess that's the, the narrow definition of it. But I think that you can hear the difference between it's a silence that it's existing just because someone's not saying something versus a silence that's existing because someone is concentrating and there's this intent on not making a sound because they don't want to miss anything. That takes us naturally to the auditorium in which the performance is taking place in your profession as an acoustic engineer. Talk us through a day in your life as an acoustic engineer as you stand in front of a concert hall or maybe a conference centre or maybe even an office space. What are you listening for? What are you looking for? What are you sensing? So if we're after a concert hall sound and we want to have good acoustics, one aspect of that is actually understanding what good acoustics are. Through a lot of research, we've actually discovered that people have a lot of different tastes when it comes to music. And that what good acoustics means for someone isn't necessarily the same as what other people will have. Whether you can hear the notes clearly, whether all the instruments are equally in balance, whether it's loud or soft, whether it sounds like it's close or distant, whether it sounds like it's all coming from one point on stage or whether it sounds like it's much broader and there's like a, a sense of three dimensionalities for sound. All those really complicated things, which different people will value different aspects to that. And so wine tasting is a really great example because there's an element of personal taste to it. And so what we've discovered from that is that you can't necessarily say that there's perfect acoustics. And until we can necessarily reduce people's individual preferences to an equation, we might not be able to optimize that mathematically either. And so what I like to think of acoustics now and my role where it's designing a concert hall or another space, is that we're actually trying to provide an experience for people. We're the designers of the sound environment. And in a concert hall, that's pretty obviously it's the purpose of the room. But in other spaces as well, we're trying to design still a good environment for sound, whether it's the office where you're working and you're hoping not to be distracted by someone on the phone three meters away or three desks away from you, or whether it's just an outdoor space where you're doing a soundscape and we want sort of our, our outdoor environment to sound as good as our indoor environment. The more that we sort of understand the way that our ears works, the, the more interesting it gets, I think. Because they have this really remarkable ability to keep track of the thousands of sound reflections that arrive at our eardrums when we're in a room. So if we hear two sounds arrive at almost exactly the same time, even from different directions, our ear is able to sort of combine them together into one note. But even though we don't hear them as two separate notes, our ears are still so process that they've come from different directions. And so that means that we, we feel this, we hear the room as having a sense of space, even if it's not being distinct in time. So if we're trying to translate that into sort of designing a concert hall, then we're trying to get this particular pattern of reflections of people's ears so that they hear enough early energy that arrives with their ears close to the sound so that it sort of fuses together and sounds immediate. And then we want some sound to arrive later and later. So it sort of blends together in a smooth sequence that we call like reverberation. 
and then also trying to avoid anything like echoes, which is sound that's arriving much later, but it's distinct, that can be distracting. And so it is really a balancing act because you want enough sound to arrive at people, but not necessarily all at the same time. And it needs to arrive in a particular sequence from particular directions at one seat. And then that's hard enough to do for one seat. And then you're potentially having to achieve this for up to two and a half thousand seats in an auditorium. How do you balance out other environmental factors like a concert hall would have air conditioning and that would also create noise and how do you balance these dimensions out? Yeah, and that's that's a really big challenge. Going back to what we were talking about earlier about there being sort of a positive silence and a negative silence, you want this to take any other distraction out of the way that people are free to have that level of attention and the, the positive silence of, of their own. So there's some spaces like Melbourne Recital Centre, the, the main hall in there is one of, if not the quietest room in Australia, and hearing a concert in there is really different to hearing a concert in another space. And how that's achieved is quite a big engineering challenge. So in a space that's as quiet as a concert hall, sometimes just the vibrations travelling through the ground, causing the surfaces of the concert hall to vibrate, are loud enough that they'll be audible. So it's quite typical if you're close to a rail line or a tram line, which Melbourne concert hall is, there's a tram that runs literally out the front, that the whole auditorium is resting on springs. And so they act as like a, a floating structure within, and the vibration in the ground can't cross the barrier of the springs to get into the structure where the concert hall is located. And that's obviously a pretty expensive thing to do when you don't do it lightly. But if that's what's required to get the level of quiet that you need, then it's something that the building has to do. Then in the air conditioning, it's the whole design for designing an air conditioning system for a concert hall is very different from the approach for an office. It's about trying to get the air to waft into the space as quietly as possible. So it might barely be moving when it sort of goes through the, the air conditioning ducts. And then that means a completely different style of an approach because you need massive, massive um, air conditioning ducts to get that volume of air that's moving so slowly that it's inaudible. In a concert hall, even the, sometimes the sound of the lights themselves is too loud. So hopefully you'll never see fluorescent lights used in a concert hall because they're too loud by themselves. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. I was curious if you had any tips to improve listening in an office environment from the perspective of an acoustic engineer. Well, there's probably three things in, in most offices that are affecting how much sound gets between people. And one of the first ones is, seems a little bit obvious, but it's, well, can you see them? Because if there's line of sight, there's also usually line of sound. And so that's why offices that have sort of um, partition barriers between desks are usually quieter and have less distraction than offices that don't. And obviously sound's only one aspect of that, and there's some benefits from being able to see what's happening and we don't really want to go to the sort of the days of cubicles and, and things like that where there's not much connection between people. But there does need to be a bit of a balance between how much you can see things and how much you can hear things. And sometimes that can, there's a trend to have too much visual connectivity, which then means that there's also too much acoustic connectivity. The second one is actually just how quiet or loud the office itself is. And it's a little bit paradoxical, but sometimes modern buildings are too quiet because we design a building and there might be a um, like a sustainability rating tool that's being used to design it. And that gives the points if it's the building's quieter than a certain value. And that's, that's an important thing to do. You don't want the building to be too loud because then that's annoying it in itself. But they haven't quite really latched onto the idea that a building can also be too quiet. So if you've ever been into an open plan office sort of late at night and you can hear what someone's saying 20 metres away across on the other side of the building. And that's probably because the air conditioning's turned off and there's nothing to sort of get in the way of the sound, what we call sort of sound masking. And so sometimes what we have to do in an office is to actually introduce some sound electronically. So a lot of offices will have a noise masking system where they're basically playing white noise up in the ceiling void or under the floor. And that's a way of just making the office a little bit louder further away from the air conditioning vents so that therefore, relatively, the sound of someone talking is quieter. So 
sometimes introducing a little bit of extra noise to an office can make things better rather than worse. And the third one is sort of looking at the reflections and things like that. And if there's big surfaces near where someone's listening that are sort of hard and reflective, they'll reflect sound very easily. And that can be a way that sound can sort of bypass a, a noise barrier or, or bypass the feeling or something like that and reflect off the surface. So sometimes putting some things up on the walls, like some um, soft furnishings or foam and things like that, which will absorb sound, can help to improve things because they'll take some of these reflections out of the way. Exactly the same thing is sort of like a home home environment where you're listening to the stereo. If the stereo is aimed at a sort of a smooth, flat wall that's going to reflect sound, then the reflection from that sound can sometimes um, distort and interfere with the sound that's coming out of the speakers. And by putting some acoustic treatment on, on the walls to absorb the reflections, you hear the sounds of the stereo much more clearly. Let's change gears and talk about the four villains of listening. And uh, which one frustrates you the most? We've got the lost listener, the shrewd listener, the interrupting listener, and the dramatic listener. Which one of those do you tend to get most frustrated with? I think I'm going to go with the lost listener. Because the other three, they're at least trying to engage with you in their own way. I think I prefer to have someone that's at least hearing me, even if they're not quite 100% getting it rather than someone that's not hearing me at all. So there's always a possibility that you can turn things around with someone that's always trying to engage with you. Which one of those do you think you are? I've got to say I'm probably a tendency to be a shrewd listener. I like solving problems, and sometimes it's uh, hard to, to focus on letting the question sort of unravel rather than jumping in with the answer. And if you were to educate somebody who'd never known anything about creating sound, but to explain it to them mathematically and how that sound wave enters the ear, how would you take us through that journey? Basically, the, the way that our hearing works is that the external part of the ear, which is called the pinna, so it acts as a little um, radar dish and sort of scoop and helps to sort of collect sound and get it into the ear canal. And oversimplifying, but... <laughs> Because of our ears being located on the side of our head, that's how we tell the difference to the sounds coming from. So a lot of the way that we understand where something's coming from has to do with either that the sound's arriving at our ears at a slightly different time, and so we can tell that it's coming from the right because we hit our right ear a little bit before we hit our left ear, or it has to do with it might be louder at one ear than the other. And so once it hits the ears, then sort of travels into the eardrum, and then gets transferred by three little bones. But the really interesting thing is that then it hits a part of the ear called the basilar membrane, which you can think of like a little cone. And the cone is tuned to different parts of sound. So at the entrance to the cone is where we hear high frequency sound, like treble sounds. And then as it goes further along is where we hear low frequency sound based. And it means that High frequency sound gets basically gets absorbed by the little hair cells on the eardrum and they vibrate kind of like little strings when they hear a sound and that's how our nerves know that something's happening because the hair cells then send an electrical signal to the brain where they're processed. Because of the shape of the basal membrane, because the low frequency notes, the bass notes, happen at the, the tip of the cone, far away from the entrance, it means that they actually can sometimes interfere with us hearing the high frequency notes. And so you can sometimes be in a location that's got a lot of low frequency noise happening and you can actually find it harder to hear high frequency sound. And the aircraft's a really good example of that. Uh, it's a lot harder to listen on an aircraft and to converse. And that has a lot to do with, with how much low frequency noise there is on an aircraft. And so it's not so much necessary that an aircraft is loud, but it's also about where it's loud that makes it so hard for us to communicate on, in an environment like that. So that's also what makes things like noise cancelling headphones so effective, is that because it's low frequency noise and it doesn't change that many times per second, our current technology like noise cancelling headphones are able to sort of pick up that noise that's pretty close to constant and they can generate the sort of the inverse of the noise mathematically so that they combine together to give you zero. And so that's why noise cancelling is really effective for things like aircraft. 
but it's not quite yet effective for lots of other noise sources. The computers and microphones and processing aren't quite good enough yet to deal with that. Cam, it's been fascinating to understand the interplay in your life of listening, a musician, and uh, an acoustic engineer. You've done an amazing job of educating our audience today and understanding why the environments that you set up are more powerful for creating deep listening and creating an impact. I've really enjoyed listening to you today. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity too. Deep listening. Kukai kikitori kuyingi sela shinene. Deep listening. Deep listening. What a privilege it was to listen to Cam and understand the maths of sound. Something I wasn't completely familiar with is the role of sound waves and how they're mathematical. I love the way Cam explained the interaction of the maths inside concert halls, but more importantly, how you can make an office environment more listening friendly. Which begs the question, how conscious are you of the environment you're in when you're listening? Sometimes a conversation is really appropriate for a corridor or a kitchen. But more often than not, if you want to have an impact beyond words, if you want to listen deeply, a quiet meeting room where you can collect your thoughts and so can the other person, without distraction, without a glass wall where you can see out, is probably one of the more powerful locations for you to engage with deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Kukai Kikitori. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Whakarongo Pohonu. Deep listening. Impact beyond words.